This is the We Get Outdoors podcast. My name is Rob Yates, I am your host, and welcome to this episode. In this episode, my co-founder, Mark Hopkins, interviews Naked and Afraid, multiple times winner, EJ Snyder. EJ is a retired army ranger, ex-sergeant major, having served 25 years, earning two Bronze Star medals, the Legion of Merit, the Order of San Maurice, and over 40 other medals and decorations while serving his nation. Today, EJ is best known from the Discovery Channel series Naked and Afraid and Dual Survivor. EJ is an extreme survivalist and adventurer, and in this episode you'll find out what makes a great partner in a survival situation. Who is EJ's favourite Naked and Afraid partner? What are the four things every outdoor enthusiast needs to learn? What is the law of threes in survival? How EJ survived growing up in New Jersey? What it takes to survive extreme situations? What's on EJ's life list? What does EJ prefer, dual survivor or naked and afraid? And much, much more. This is the We Get Outdoors podcast and let's jump straight into this epic episode. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now. So today we are so fortunate to have EJ Schneider joining us. Um, now, bizarrely enough, when I feel like EJ has been part of my family for, for quite a big part, because most evenings when my son's with me, we sit down and we turn on the TV and our two programmes we're obsessed by is Naked and Afraid and Dual Survival. And uh, EJ formed the strongest pair that my son has ever been uh, witness to, which is 40 day challenge with Jeff, which we'll touch on. But EJ, it's awesome to touch base. Like I said, I feel like I've known you by watching you and being part of some of your challenges that you face. But welcome and so looking forward to the next uh, hour or so. Man, I really appreciate uh, you inviting me out, Mark, to uh, have this discussion and have this interview with you. And uh, anytime we can talk about getting outside, it's a, it's a great day for me. The, you know, the, out, the outdoors have saved my life. Uh, multiple times throughout my life just by being able to connect with nature and be out there and being blessed to do the things I get to do now uh, just is really amazing I love sharing so I appreciate you having me on and uh, getting to meet with everybody and chat with fans and those that aren't fans get ready to become a fan <laughs> well we're gonna I'm sure we're gonna be sharing some really interesting stories especially what you just touched on there about how how nature really gets into your soul and sometimes saves your soul um, but I'd just like to, to start off with, um, you talk a lot about, about your sort of train-as-you-fight approach to survival. Can you just elaborate a little bit on, on what you mean by that? All right. So after being in the military in the United States Army for, you know, 25 years before I retired, you know, we always had a train-as-you-fight approach. And so what that meant was when you went to battle, you, know, you were ready to deal with it. You were ready, uh, if you trained the way you fought, when you actually hit the real thing, uh, hopefully you were better prepared and uh, less life was lost, less injuries, and you were more successful. So I adapted that into the way I look at training for survival. Even for myself, uh, I feel that the time to know how to do something like a bow drill fire or a hand drill or, or you know, just set up a proper shelter is not when you're out there. It's You need to know how to do it now, and you need to set the conditions for success early. So Push yourself in a safe and training environment when you're back home where it's safe, you know, you can get to a road within a mile or so and you're not in any real heavy danger. Uh, try going out there without your tent, without your sleeping bag. You know, maybe have that stuff stashed away somewhere in a pack, but don't, don't go to it or have it in your vehicle. But go out overnight and try to start you know, with a bit of shelter on fire and just try to see without a blanket or sleep bag, how do you do? You know, because until you you get that experience and understand what that suck feels like, 
then you'll never know how you're going to be able to handle it or take it. I'm not saying go out, put yourself in a hypothermic situation. Always be smart when you train. I always like with my students, I always have emergency stuff always around to handle uh, when I push them so that nobody gets hurt. You know, I was a professional instructor in the army as a ranger instructor for three years, a survival instructor with the SEER department and student safety is always a major concern. So, but I want to push you, you know, when, when you're starting a fire, I may come by with a hand fan and blow your flame out before you get a, you know, get that match going. So just something to stress you out because when you're out there and you're cold and you're tired and you're hungry and you're getting wet because there's rain coming in, you know, you got to get a shelter because your life depends on it. So that's what I mean by train as you fight in a survival approach. It's, you know, you, you never know when a survival situation is going to happen, happen at any moment, at any place, any time with whatever you have with you. So I always want people to be prepared and be able to uh, so much. It's a very stressful situation to understand how to calm that down so you don't make a bad decision and you, and you, you attack survival with a smart approach. Master the basics well, so that way if you're in trouble, you know, you can get out of that situation uh, relatively quick. And when you're getting outdoors, you know, we've had a lot of problems here uh, on our Appalachian Trail where we've got a lot of backpackers that are just sometimes first-timers getting out there on the trail and they make the mistake of wandering off the trail and go see something cool and they can't figure out how to get back onto the trail. They wind up getting lost. And next thing we know, we have a, a situation where a person needs to be rescued or they perish. We've had several perish because of it. And I always tell people when you get outside, whatever it's a day hike or you're going skiing or you're going on a hunting trip, you always want to be prepared for the worst case scenario to, to happen. And so always, you know, pack a smart little handy dandy survival kit, even if it's just, you know, lighters, you know, a, a life straw for water and a, a, a tarp or a poncho so you can get out of the wetness, you know, quick shelter. I, I want people, to, you know, when they when they go outside, hell yeah, get outside, enjoy it, suck the bone marrow out of life, man. Get out there and get after it. But be safe, be smart about it, and understand that, you know, that situation can happen anywhere. So that's kind of where that mentality comes. Train as you fight, do it right, and be ready all the time. Yeah, and it's, that's always like the challenge that we have a little bit with the outdoors is is the outdoors is magical. It's beautiful. It's also the fact it is outdoors. It's it's inaccessible as well, and you physically have to push yourself. It's always getting that balance right between yeah. physically pushing yourself, but also being prepared. Yes, and, and I'm the kind of guy, obviously, who likes to push his limits and just see how much I can take, how far I can push it. I think the human body is very amazing. It can adapt to certain things. Uh, but, for instance, in my very first Naked Afraid in Tanzania, Kelly and I had very little water for several days till we could get a fire going before we could boil it. Big bubbles, little trouble, so we sure it was safe. Uh, African water, mm -hmm. sorry, just not something I'm going to just – stick my face in. I drank some pretty bad water in my time. Uh, but we were pushed to almost five days with just several ounces of water each day to keep us going from some rainwater catches that we, we found in the rocks. So, But I was able to do that, succeed and keep my, my wits about me because I've been training a certain way, rather extreme, but I am an extreme survival. So I, I'm pushing those limits just to, to make sure for one, for me, for my own life, that when the, when the day comes, I need to do that. I can do it. But two, uh, it's just, it's, it's a technique. It's, uh, and, and some people, experts will argue all day long, what's right, what's wrong, what's in the book, what's not. When your life's on the line for me, you do what you got to do to get out of there. And if it, if it worked, guess what? You survive. Yeah. And that's the thing as well. And also, you know, you know, your body. I remember a hike I did, um, where I got, completely lost in, the, in a part of South Africa called the Wild Coast. Okay, um, yes. And we did, we ended up walking with about 45 miles in a day, carrying everything wow. and rain. And, and again, you get to that stage where we are so disorientated, but you find that one landmark that you recognize and you don't yes. let anything distract you about that landmark. You hit that landmark. That's right. Whatever it takes to get there. And, uh, you know, the human spirit is an amazing thing. The will to live. My motto that I have on my logos is to esponte superspec, which means survive by your own will. I uh, take the Latin phrase from a lot of the, in the American army, we all, all units have a lot of Latin phrases. And when I was in the Rangers, you know, we had uh, uh, sua sponte, which of your own accord, 
And so it's kind of a throwback to my ranger buddies, my survival attitude. And I really think that if you have an iron will, the heart of a lion, uh, a human can get through most things. You know, when we have these earthquakes we heard about in India. And after digging for a week, they find a little two year old kid still alive. It's because it's that will to survive and not and not hurt. And, uh, you know, so that, that's where kind of a lot of my attitude comes from when I approach these things. So let's, let's touch base then on, on where, where you came from and how you got to where you are now. Um, growing up in, in northern New Jersey, and then you mentioned your, your 25 years in the military. How did that all sort of, what journey did you go on from growing up into the military? What was the, the highlights, the things that you can remember that really took you towards where you yeah. are now? Well, my folks divorced when I was very young. And when we used to see my dad on the weekends, he was a big outdoorsman and he used to take us out to the woods and we camp, fish, hunting, trapping, doing those kinds of things, tracking. And um, when I would get out of the concrete jungle into the real woods, I just fell in love with it. I felt it's where I belong. And so I would find solace in it. And, you know, I got bullied as a kid a bit. So I would find myself running to the woods just to get away from that stuff and to heal myself. And to understand how to deal with those things and it kind of made me tougher can't run from the streets though so you have to figure out how to deal with that you know mm -hmm. and uh so i took to uh, a lot of uh sports weightlifting, learning how to defend myself to uh, kind of combat the bullies i'm not uh one to put violence first but when you ask for that man to step across that line you're in a bad you'll be in a bad way mm -hmm. i've thrown a lot of uh, outside the I've never thrown a first punch in my life outside the ring or in combat, but I've thrown a hell of a lot of last punches. Mm -hmm. So uh, my childhood was rather rough living up in a lot of tough Italian neighborhoods uh, through the 70s and early 80s. You got a lot of gangs and it was a lot different than the gangs of, you know, the 90s and the 2000s, but um, still, still tough stuff. And um, as I became a teenager, one of the things I wanted to become, was I, I was doing a lot of theater in, in high school and wanted to be an actor and a stuntman. My mom said, well, that's a terrible idea. You'll starve. <laughs> I said, well, you can't do that. You're my mom. You, you got to support me. Oh, it's, I, I won't support that. That's, that's an awful idea. So off to the Army I went, and it was a natural fit for me, uh, being athletic and loving to fight and those kinds of things, and I wanted to serve my country. So off I went. And um, When I was in the Army, I went to Ranger School in 1988, and I got my first taste of that uh, little minuscule environmental survival stuff when we went to you know in the ranger school you go to the, the you go to the mountains the desert down to the swamps to learn jungle operations and stuff like that so you learn basic survivals for those area fell in love with it and wanted to learn more and more and more so when i became a ranger instructor in florida uh, i became the primary survival and tracking instructor there so i went to formal survival school then i was hooked i was hooked to life and uh started teaching on the side to civilians uh, just on the weekends, gathering friends, trying to learn uh, my art. You know, we had Y2K coming 2012. So I wanted to be prepared for myself and my loved ones to be able to survive bad days. And so my training really ramped up. And then when I found myself getting ready to get out of the army, I got back into some acting and some stunt work, but uh, that wasn't translating into a lot of work or a way to get into military tech advising on film. So I took a contract job teaching survival to Green Berets and other soldiers in the Special Warfare Center at Fort Bragg, North Carolina for about five years. And I started applying for a couple of reality shows that I thought were great shows that I loved, a Survivor and a few others. And long story short, I got auditioned for several, made the final cast, got cut last minute, but then Discovery Channel found me, uh, was recruiting me to replace one of the original hosts off of Dual Survival. I went out, tried out. Unfortunately, came in second place. Don't know why. Uh, my resume was clean. The other guys wasn't. That's the way it goes. Next thing I know, I'm sitting out in the middle of Tanzania, Africa, buck naked with a strange woman I didn't even know. And they told me, all right, here's your knife. Here's a pot. I'll see you on top of that mountain in 21 days. Go for it. And we were the very first ones ever to film it. And then the rest was kind of history, as they say, because I got on a fantastic, amazing journey. And uh, it really, it really has saved me in, in a way that, I'm so grateful for because getting out of the army I had some transition issues, trying to adapt into civilian life after being a soldier for a quarter of a century. Uh, it was, it was, was having trouble fitting in as a square peg in a round hole. And, uh, you know, so doing this survival instructing with the, as a contractor with the SEER department when I got out helped, 
but getting out in the wild and just facing things. And, um, you know, when I'm in the woods, I hear God's voice loudest. So that's where I settle stuff up. And uh, so I did that one in Tanzania, 21 days successful, uh, despite Africa trying to kill me with an infected foot. Seven months later, went back to do the Amazon episode when three people quit. Did another 21 days there. Um, got hyperthermic, uh, the worst of my life, in the middle of the Amazon jungle, in the middle of the night mm -hmm. with a terrible rainstorm. Um, and then I went out for the 40-day challenge in uh, Colombia uh, with Jeff and a bunch of the others, uh, 12 of us total, and uh, knocked out 40 days, first ones to do it. And uh, people keep asking, why do you keep going out? Isn't that taking years off your life? And I tell them, smile at them and say, on the contrary, it's adding years to my life. And uh, I'll be 54 here in about a month. And uh, I'm not stopping one iota. Uh, I suck the bone marrow out of life every chance I get. That means getting outside, getting after it. was blessed to go back and do a season of dual survival, see some amazing places, seven episodes. And uh, I don't know, heard that heard uh, somebody may have just got back from somewhere for a fourth run from something, but I really can't say nothing about it. So. <laughs> You heard it first here. <laughs> um, so just uh, before we move on to onto the outdoor specifically, um, what's what are you doing at the moment? And what are the things that you're loving about life at the moment? At the moment, hanging out at one of my favorite coffee spots, having a little little coffee and uh, a nice bright sunny day. Uh, but I've been consulting since season three with Naked Afraid and Discovery Channel on, on a bunch of different shows. Uh, you know, on locations, on um, ideas of shows they want to get developed, as well as I've been working with casting, and I um, I interview uh, folks that are getting ready to possibly go out on Naked Afraid Challenge, and I interview them to find out uh, their background, if they have the chops to get outside, what kind of skills they have, and if they'll, you know, if they're a viable candidate to be considered to go out on this amazing challenge, which. One of my greatest, proudest things is that because me and Kelly got it right in Tanzania, which was the pilot episode, some 150 other people have gotten to go out and have that once in a lifetime experience. So I've been doing that, uh, casting, consulting, and I do a lot of writing. Uh, I do knife and gear reviews. I give uh, survival tips. I have my own column called The Edge of Survival. And uh, so I just like getting information out to folks. Uh, I write for several blog magazines. I'm actually getting ready to uh, uh, start working on a book and, uh, you know, get people inspired and motivated to just live life, get after life, as well as get outside. And uh, I'm always looking for other uh, adventures uh, in the future, whether it's in film or doing, uh, I, I offer a lot of uh, survival training as a guest instructor. I travel all over the country. I do appearances and motivational speaking. At different events, I do a lot of trade shows, gun shows, knife shows, uh, outdoor gear shows, where I make appearances and get to talk with people as a either a panel, a panelist, or I do a motivational speech at each of these events. So I'm always for hire at ejsnyder.com. You, you know, if you're looking for someone to come out and uh, speak to your event or you know teach you something, I also do uh, guided treks. I do a lot of hiking up through the Appalachian Mountains. So I take people on, you know three, four, five day excursions. And we offer several packages. Like we have a dual survival experience package. We have a naked afraid experience package, but we will put you, you want to see the TV show. You want to live it. We'll put you in it. Just get in touch with us and we'll, we'll pick the location. And we'll get, we'll get you out there. And you'll have an amazing safe time. We'll put all the many people do it and they sign. Yeah. They sign up for three days and um, a lot of them can only make it a day or two. Good. So, so talk about, I'm fascinated uh, about that, um, and obviously it's something that when, when we watch Naked and Afraid, we're looking at the types of people that are on the show, and I'm really interested in, in your, your work there as interviewing them and really understanding, yeah. and so what do you look for in those kind of right. people that you think are going to be successful? Okay, for me, it gets to a point of, you know, we've gone through the gamut over here, and we're starting to go abroad now, in other other nations looking for good qualified folks. Uh, but here in our community, the survival community is only so big. So you, you pretty much kicked over every stone and every survivalist that has got really good chops to go out there has probably gone out there. Once in a while, one out of 10 people will kick over a stone and will find somebody that's actually been living out in the woods, doesn't have a TV, but has the skills to go out. So 
I've had the um, challenge of interviewing people and uh, going in deeper than just survival outdoor skills to find people uh, and their inner qualities that could mm -hmm. probably take this challenge on, get out there and maybe and be successful at it. So I've had to revamp the PSR system. I have instead of three categories, I've got six. That way, when I take an average of, of the total score I give you and divide it by six, I get an initial PSR. What happens to the PSR after it leaves me? Not my responsibility. I don't know what happens. I can't tell you what happens. I know I give you a true score when you leave me uh, of where you're at. And so what I look for, mental toughness, uh, your, you know, your mental capacity, how well you think. Do you think outside the box? Are you a critical thinker? How do you handle situations? So I ask certain questions that give me the answers that tell me a lot about a person. I also look at their physical fitness and their health. Are they in good shape? You know, are they triathletes? Can they take the beat down of a very extreme challenge where you're going to go out there completely naked in a very extreme environment with very little? Then I look at their uh, ingenuity, adaptability, flexibility. What things have they gone through in their life that, that shows me they have the ability to adapt on the fly, make a good decision when things go awry and, and, and you know, keep themselves alive as well as their partner? I look at their life experiences, their jobs, their skills. What do they do for hobbies? Are they backpacking every other weekend? Are they, are they getting outside at least? And then I get into the outdoor survival skills where I look at shelter, fire, and water. And then I look at subsistence, meaning food, uh, hunting, trapping, fishing, uh, plant identification, gathering, foraging, that kind of stuff. And so all those categories, after I interview a person, and I've got some really interesting questions, for instance, uh, are you an optimist, a pessimist, or a realist? Hmm. And then they all look at me and go, well, I'm an optimist pes uh, optimist, and a realist. I'm a, I'm a combo. I'm like, there's no such thing. Yeah. An optimist looks at the glass half full. A pessimist looks at it at half empty. The realist looks at the glass and goes, hmm, I got a half a glass of water. Maybe the waitress will come by and fill it back up. Maybe she won't. I could just suck it all down now and suck it up or I can sip it. But either way, that's the situation. And so then they realize, oh, okay, I've got to be one of these three. Yeah. Then I asked, do you want to be lucky or good? And people scratched their head and it's, you know, it is a viable thing. Luck is always nice, but I'd rather be good because then I make my own luck. But yeah, you got control. there's no right or wrong answers when I interview people. It's really just getting to know them. It's a conversation. It takes about 30, 40 minutes. And uh, like, the, but when I got interviewed uh, by a guy named Tim Smith out of Maine, he's a good friend, really good survivalist. It was a quick interview. I don't even, you know, it was like 10 minutes maybe, but they recruited me to do. I really to go through the normal interview process. They just, he just had a few questions. I think it was more of a formality uh, because they really wanted to hang their hat on the you know, really tough spot and figured if this guy can make it to this really tough place, then all the other locations we got in people should be okay. And that's, <laughs> that's how you explain And you were the true guinea pig. Yeah. Yes, me and Kelly, Kelly Nightlinger, and I couldn't have asked for a tougher lady to be with me, I'll tell you. So let's, let's start delving into some of the stories I'm sure you've got from your, your survival days. Let's just start with some of the hardest, hardest places, hardest things you've done in your life from, a, from an outdoors perspective. Um, I would say some of the hardest lessons and the best lessons I've got were where I went into a situation, uh, rushed out the door or unprepared or forgot something that one critical item you needed. And then you had to figure out how to get through that day. Um, you know, uh, it, it could be, you know, just going out for a, a day hike and it, you take a wrong turn because your compass broke or whatever. And you went and drifted off a little bit off course in the desert. It's easy to do. And then you're like, Oh my God, I only brought two bottles of water. I got to get back. I know I got another 10 miles hike in the heat of the day. How do I handle it? And then it gives you, sorry, somebody's alarm's going off. You're not in the outdoors now. <laughs> no, not at the moment. And I, unfortunately, this, I, where, where I live at the moment, what's going on? Let's just wait for that to stop. Why somebody would set their alarm when they're going to a coffee shop is ridiculous. <laughs> Quite annoying. Is it a nice car though that's beat this game up? Not really. <laughs> more money on the. Uh... Yeah, the, the alarm is, is better, probably worth more than the bumper. 
<laughs> and and it was set off because another car next to it started up. Apologies for that. We can stay uh, longer. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, so you know, I always found, you know, when you're out there with another person and you're going through something really tough and you get the situation uh like Laura and I did in the Amazon, we we're trying to get to extraction in the middle of the night. Uh, this biblical storm comes in, lightning hitting the water. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up, knowing I have to get off this river or we're going to wind up getting electrocuted. And um, it was pitch black. We had no lights, no torches. It's, you know, you're in the middle of the night, just rowing down the Amazon River. Really, dude, you're in your car. There's no cure, folks, for stupidity and being a moron. <laughs> Really That's not being an optimist, realist, or a pessimist. Yeah, it's just sad. Wow. Uh, is it? Can you hear that on your side? It's very, very faint. Okay. I'll do this. Anyways, so uh, we were sitting there, uh, and we had to get off the river and find a spot to shelter up while this rainstorm was coming in. And Lou is pitch black, could not find a, a proper shelter. There was not good materials that we could feel around to find. Just found a huge um, rainforest tree. We wound up getting in the root crevice, which was a V. Uh, both of us were shivering on the, on the verge of getting hypothermia. I mean, we were starting to talk in tongues at the end of this thing. And it got to a point where the storm passed. It was still kind of raining, but I grabbed her. And in my best tongues, it's like, let's go. We just got to get rolling. And we got in the boat and started rowing. But she's the only other person that understands exactly what I went through in that situation. So seven, always having somebody with you, whether it's a great experience to enjoy or a terrible one, I've always found very rewarding. Because uh, when you go through something really crappy, you have someone that always knows what you went through. And so with the Naked Afraid Challenges, it's always great to have a partner out there to help and go through those things. Uh, but experiencing it by yourself is uh gives you a lot of appreciation for having others around you. Mm. Uh, I like doing survival things by myself. I've done a lot of them over time because I, I love the solitude and it gives me a chance to work through stuff that's going on in my life or my head or whatever. Uh, good time to meditate and pray and get in connection with nature and God. Uh, but when you go through something crappy by yourself, you ever been out there on your own solo trip and then you tumble down the side of this mountain a hundred feet, skin your knees up, sprain your ankle, and you got to make a crutch to walk yourself out of there. Like I've had to do 10 miles with the makeshift crutch because I class three sprained my ankle with my pack on, had to climb back up out of this very steep ravine. And that really sucked. I had no one to help me. No one will know what I went through. And I got no one to tell the story with because they'll never understand how bad it was because only I went through it. So I've had a few of those things happen. And thankfully, the Grim Reaper is always really close at hand, so I know right where he's at. So he hasn't been able to stop lights out. So when I'm riding down my Harley Davidson of life, I always like to keep death right in my sidecar, right alongside me. So I know right where he's at, so he can't ambush me. Yeah, you keep your enemies I don't know if, that, I don't know if that quite answered your question, but... Uh, it does. Um, that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to actually ask one of um, my son's questions he's got for you okay. here. Because um, right. obviously he watches the, the Naked and Afraid all the time. And see, we see certain people tap out through medical reasons. Right. A lot of people tapping out because emotionally they just can't cope with it. They can't cope with being away from, from the family. So my son's question is, how do you cope being away from family for such a long time? For me, and being away from loved ones, I think, uh, goes back to my military days. Always heading off on a training exercise or heading off on a mission or heading to war and understanding how to set those that you're leaving behind to handle your, your absence. Cause they're going to go through their own thing. Uh, but you can't put your mind in that headspace. You have to keep your mind focused on the task at hand. You know, every day I say my prayers, send them back and off and, and, and hope that all uh, everything going on, that's not right in front of me. Is going to be okay and taken care of, but you have to mentally, you know, prepare yourself that, you know, I'm going to be gone for three weeks or I'm going to be gone for 40 days or whatever your length of time is you're gone and understand that, you know, if you don't stay focused on what you're doing, if I go to war and I'm not focused in, 
you know, combating the enemy of my country, uh, I may give that asshole an opportunity to send me packing and, and uh, you know, give me that privilege of dying for my country, which I did not want. <laughs> I, had, I had, you know, I wanted to get back home. So I think that focus was to, as long as I, I, I get out there, I focus on the mission and I approach each survival challenge. Uh, and I've, I've, I've actually evolved a lot with that attitude, but I always, that's my base is I'm going to approach this thing as a challenge and it's a mission. And the mission is to succeed and get to the end. I don't want to be one of those folks that after 20, you know, tapping before 21 days, uh, I've been put in serious medical conditions. Uh, my foot in Africa got infected and almost killed me. The blood almost uh, got poisoned. Uh, but I had the attitude, I'm going to chop this leg off and get to the finish line. Whether I would have really done that or not to my uh, British executive producer, uh, I don't think he saw the sarcasm in my tone, but I didn't really <laughs> thought I was going to do it. But that was my attitude was, I'm going to get to the end of this thing. In the Amazon, I was hacking through a tree, and my partner's blade was so sharp. And I know the knife maker. I knew the guy. He makes really good blades. Went right through the tree. It was the last pole I was cutting for the day, probably the 50th pole, and right into my shin bone. Going to need seven stitches. My attitude was, I'm going to go find some bullet ants and staple this thing closed, keep it clean, and I'm getting out of here. Well, they have a medical support team on site, and they had a brand new producer first time out in the field. And they thought yeah, I was crazy. This guy's going to lose his leg. And I knew better. The ancient Amazonians did this very same technique, uh, but they overruled me and I had to get stitches. And uh, that really bummed me out because I thought, oh, man, I don't want any help getting through these challenges. But I made it to the end. And about three or four days later, they told me I'd have to get the stitches out at the end of the, uh, uh, at the, end of the uh, challenge. But I told them, I'll see you in three or four days because I heal like Wolverine. And you're gonna pull these things out. We're gonna we're gonna get to swimming again because I love the water. Uh, so uh, I guess it, my point is, you know, mental toughness and mental fortitude is developed through the things you go through in life. You know, trying to find a job, getting through college, going into the army, getting through basic training. All these challenges you get put in front of you, uh, whether it's an emotional challenge or it's a physical challenge, and something you mentally have to push through. Those things develop your mental toughness in life. And so, you know, I look at those things. When I get a wall in front of me in life, whether that challenge is right in front of me, if I can't open a door and go through it because there is no door, if I can't get open, well, my mental attitude is the way I just live my life. I won't take no for an answer. Uh, I'll, I'll get over there and kick your door in if I want to find out a, if, if I need to get a solution. Or I'm, if there's a stall moving forward because people are falling down, I'm going to grab as many people in each hand as I can. Very noisy little city. I, I <laughs> only take the city this much. Uh, but if, if people are like soldiers are falling down for me, I'm picking you up and I'm going to drag you to the end because it's just my attitude is I was put on this planet to face tough days, tough things, and get through them and drag others with me if I have to. Um, so that is a great question, really is. I mean, some people just, they feel they've gone through some things in life and um, they get out there. When you're stressed and pushed to things that are deep down inside you, uh, and uh, when you're out there in the wild with no electronics, Unplugged from society, which is an amazing place to be. You get your whole body gets a gets a restart, the body clock. When you're sitting around the fire, sometimes at night the demons of your life will show up around you and sit with you. And then you have to deal with them. And so for a lot of people, they just can't mentally get past some of those things. And sometimes when you see those challenges out there on Naked Afraid, people may look like they're going through something that's uh, oh, the bug bites, I can't take it, I can't take it. But there's probably something else back in there that's really going on. And some people have never been away from their families. And I don't fault them for that. I've looked at the, the word TAP, T-A-P, and I've added something to it, totally at peace. It's an acronym, totally at peace. So when I see people tapping on the challenges, they've come to a point for themselves where they are at peace with their decision. And if it's, I just mentally can't take it, I physically shouldn't be here. I'm missing my family. It's a mental breakdown or it's a medical thing. My tap is always when I cross the finish line for me. Um, 
So I don't know. I'm known for my big heart, mental toughness. And um, it's just something that I think you go through certain things in life and it gets stronger, you get more hardened through it. And I always tell people, hard times don't last, but hard people do. And uh, tough days, they, they won't last forever. And when you go through tough things, I think in life, you don't help people by coddling them. You help them by, like I said, train as you fight. Put people in stressful situations while they're training or you challenge them and they will be better for it. It's going to suck while you're going through it. It really isn't going to be fun. I've had that. And most recently, uh, very humbly have had it. And I'm better for it. And once you go through something tough once, the second time around, it's a lot easier. Yeah. It gets easier and easier. Um, so, you know, the only thing uh, you can't predict is sometimes with what Mother Nature's going to throw you. And then that little bugger named Murphy with Murphy's Law. He's always <laughs> waiting to ambush you. So, you know, just stay flexible is what I tell people. So great question. It was kind of a long answer, but, you know, uh, I've had to look at mental toughness. And it's a key factor when I'm interviewing people. Uh, and, and when I tell people, I say, hey, how much percentage do you think survival is mental versus physical? For me, and I've written several articles on this, it's 90% mental. That 10% physical better be 100% right because you're going to need every bit of it. But mental, getting mm -hmm. through tough things, surviving tough things in life, whether you're fighting cancer or whatever, mental. So, so talking about mental as well, and so another question from, from my son, um, both in dual survival and naked and afraid, uh, partners are a key part of it. And you've mentioned Kelly, Laura, Jeff. Um, in your opinion, what makes, he's again, Seth's question, what makes a great partner? And if you had to pick one, who is the one that you felt at most at ease with? Um, what makes a great partner is someone that compliments you. Someone who shores up your weaknesses and you do the same for them, compliments you in strengths, you know, and uh, total understanding, uh, commitment to each other, having each other's back, teamwork is everything, and, and being able to compromise um, with each other. When you don't see eye to eye, um, come to a place of understanding why they think that way doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just the way they think or the way they feel. and you, it, it can be tough. There's an understanding of each other, compromise, or compromising for each other's uh, position, uh, and meeting somewhere in the middle that's good for the team. Uh, it's a lot tougher, and you have a lot of problems. Um, so, you know, Kelly and I, uh, we we came together. We had some struggles in the beginning. That's just a fact. Uh, we had different visions, uh, different understandings why we we're out there, and it wasn't either one of our fault. I think it's because it was the first time filming this thing. Not even the crew knew what the heck they were going to film or what to do. So we didn't have a lot of clear guys shown well. We wanted to beat our chest, both of us, and be heroes. And, you know, she's a tough lady. And so we had to get to a very emotional point to where we understood that we were there for each other. I wouldn't have got through it without Kelly helping me with my foot. I got very humbled by it. I changed my thought process on, on that whole thing. Uh, but in the end, we became a team, and we got to the end uh, with each other's help. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I had Laura and Jeff, and I even had Hakeem and Shane for a little bit uh, with me and Jeff, uh, who are two other partners I had. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how a, a good team is, is two people that come together with the same common goal, may have two different ideas of how to get there, but as long as we compromise and respect each other and, and help each other always, and, and then having skills that complement each, each other is very key. And for me personally, uh, you know, I love all my partners. They're, they're amazing. Me and Shane, we, we've become literally brothers from the first season and talk every day still to this day for six, five, six years now. Uh, but, and, and I, I know that guy always has my back, but, uh, my best, my, uh, I think my most successful partnership out there was when me and Laura went to the Amazon and, uh, got our second, first two to ever do it twice. Uh, we just, our skill sets were so different, but complement each other. We had that one little incident with the eel, which was our only, literally, our only disagreement out there in 21 days, which was a beautiful thing. And it helped me grow and evolve as a man, as, as a survivalist, and um, have a better appreciation for nature, get back in touch with my primal roots, become the original savage again. And, uh, uh, you know, Laura is, 
She is one of the most capable survivals on our planet. Forget just female survivals, but just as a survivalist in general. Uh, both been out there five times on Naked Afraid, knows her stuff. You give me a Laura Zara any day of the week as a partner, I know it's going to be a, a successful mission. Cool. So if you, if you could plan now your ideal trip, outdoor experience trip, um, and it could be something you do on your own or with a partner, what would that trip look like for you? Um, you know, I've, I've, one I haven't gotten to do yet and I really want to do is, is hike the entire length of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, you know, as I get older, you know, I'm still physically uh, decent enough to keep walking and able to do it. But that is a long trek. And that's one of the ones I've, I've really, I, my kid brother before, you know, my late kid brother, he, we lost him before his 22nd birthday uh, many years ago now. But um, that was something that he and I wanted to do at some point in the life. And the, and the goal was when I retired from the military, let's go hike the trail uh, and just, just, just go do it. And so that's something on my life list. I don't have bucket list, bucket list end. I only have life lists. That list never ends. Uh, and something on my suck the bone marrow life list is to do the Appalachian Trail or maybe the PCT over on the West Coast. Hell, maybe I'll do all three and do the Continental Divide Trail. Um, but at least when I get the Appalachian Trail, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a trail that was used back in the old pioneering days to move supplies along the mountains from point A to point B. And um, a lot of people traveled it and um, kind of a history nut. So I, I, I have a little nostalgic for that. So for me, that's personally one of the trips I would like to do uh, outside of that. Um, uh, outside this country, um, there's some great stuff over there in the United Kingdom, up in Scotland and stuff that I've, I've been looking at. And uh, there's some treks in Australia that I'd like to get go out and do as far as outside the United States. I recently uh, was up in Alaska, up in the Arctic region, uh, doing a, a, did a nine, nine or 10 day uh, backpack up there with a guide. It was an amazing time. Always I hadn't been to Alaska and finally got up there and so that has uh, really invigorated my spirit again to get out there and see some really amazing things. You know, and I'm going to tell your audience, you know, you've got amazing things right in your hometown. I've asked them, have you ever been abroad? Some of them never left their, their town, let alone their state here in the United States, which is crazy to me. We have so many great state parks here, national parks and forests. Uh, and I want to get out there and see them. And then I want to see stuff around the world. So uh, for me, the, you know, yeah, the Appalachian Trail, hike the whole thing. That's one of these trips that I really want to do. And um, there's a few places outside the, my country that I want to get to. United Kingdom has a few, Australia and uh, Iceland. I, I'd like to go see Iceland. Yeah, Iceland is a beautiful place to do that. Um, you talked about the trail. I'm just interested in sort of moving track a little bit in terms of passing on sort of one or two of your, your tips, your top tips. So, a lot of our listeners are, like I said, hikers, mountaineers, they're kayakers. Um, and obviously we hope that they are as prepared, but in nature, bad things happen. Um, yes, they do. What kind of things would you be, A, saying, you've mentioned previously about a, like a safety tips. What kind of things yeah. would you say you should be doing if you get in certain situations? There's three things on this planet every person should know how to do, and for good reason. First, Know how to swim and be good at it because it'll save your life. You fall in the water, you want to be able to swim and not drown. Two, basic first aid. You can use it on yourself and someone else so you can save your own life and someone else's. Just basic CPR, basic stop bleeding, basic first aid, understanding of, of medical. All that stuff's helpful out in the wild when you're out there. And three, learn basic survival skills. You don't have to be a primitive fire expert, but know how to you know, start a proper fire, you know, what materials, where to start it, how to start it, how to maintain it, know how to purify water, whether you're having a filter system to do it with a, uh, a stainless steel water bottle, not the double walled one that'll blow up on you, a single wall stainless steel container, you can carry water in it, you can boil water in it. When you boil water, big bubbles, little troubles for one minute rolling bubble, keep it pure you know, carry out a poncho or a, a nice small tarp, something to get a, cover your basics in survival. Look at the core four, shelter, water, fire, and then food, you know, and then with those four core, if you can cover those, then you can maybe hit the other tenets of survival, navigation, 
communication, you know, rescue, those type things. But if you have a kid, something in a Ziploc bag, even a small, you know, for the ladies, something you can fit in your purse or a backpack, guys, you know, just cover the basics and know that you have them. And I always say have a backup to the backup. I think most people, they leave their house without a lighter in one pocket and a second lighter in another. You're an idiot. You know, primitive fire is so difficult. Why make life harder on yourself? It's tough enough out there, especially in a situation when you get an emergency. So I would say learn how to swim, basic first aid, get a basic survival kit, know how to use it. And people say, what's the best knife in a survival situation? Well, the one you have, of course, but get one that works for you. Don't buy my cool SXB because you think it looks badass. You get one that works for you that you know how to use. And when you bash it in your right hand, if you're right-handed, then switch to your left hand. Practice things with your offhand. What if you break this hand and you're in a survival situation? Well, you better be kind of proficient using the other hand, whichever one that is. And those are some little tips that I throw out there to people all the time. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Chet. That's um, uh, really insightful stuff. Um, I'm going to go to some quick fire questions now. So all they're right. either or questions for you. Okay. We'll start with a nice one. Beer, wine, or whiskey? And I, and I indulge in all three. But I got to say, a good craft beer goes a long way with me. Uh, beach or mountain? Mountain. Jungle or desert? Jungle. Your one survival item you'll never leave home without? The SXB, Skull Crusher's Extreme Blade. The world's only one tool option survival fighting knife. Topsknives.com. Get yours today. Good plug. <laughs> Two wheels or four? Four. Fire or shelter? Fire. Uh, meat or veg? Meat. Always meat. <laughs> I was forced to be a vegetarian for three weeks. Didn't like it. Meat. I'm a caveman. Look at this forehead. That's a Neanderthal. Car or truck? Truck. Wood or gas stove? Oh. <laughs> Go again? That truck's a beautiful truck. We've got a big brand here, Toyota Hilux. Oh, the beautiful trucks. Oh. Um, what was wood, the next question? Wood or gas stove? Wood. Lake or river? River. You're going places. Winter or summer? Summer sucks being cold. <laughs> Grand Canyon or Jellystone? Ooh, that's a tough one. Yellowstone. Thunderstorm or snowstorm? Snowstorm. Dual survival or naked and afraid? Oh, <laughs> I'm joking. That last one, I would tell you don't have to answer that one. Let's start checking in. Ooh, that's a definite. <laughs> Both have their value in certain ways. Naked Afraid is the most real survival challenge out there, and it will put you to your test to your limits. You want to prove you're a real survival or a, real, a true badass, that's the challenge. Duel, I like because it made me challenge my mental thinking ability to get out of bad situations and teach others how to do it. A wonderful, uh, a wonderful show to film and to teach others by. It's seen some amazing places. It had one of my uh, best buddies on the planet to do it with. Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So with all your experience, and obviously as you, you've gone through military and all your extreme stuff, and you've seen all the trends and you've seen how the outdoor world is changing, just from a participation enthusiast, what do you think is the next big thing that's gonna be happening in the outdoor world? Well, you know, people are always, you know, man is always trying to climb that mountain because it's there. And man is always pushing the limits of what they can handle and what they can do. We see it with these obstacle course races. We see it with the uh, enduro marathon running 50 to 100 miles. You know, a lot of the stuff I wish was around when I was a lot younger and crazy shape that I could do some of the stuff because I still got that adrenaline junkie stuff going on. So I see for the adrenaline junkie, that's why they're flying in squirrel suits all over the place. I don't know. I think it's going to be some kind of crazy Luke Skywalker high-speed jetpack, people flying across the sky right before our very eyes. You know, 
something that's just really extreme and pushing the limit because we're always trying to do something extra extreme, even when it's putting your life on the line. Um, and that's why I think people are so intrigued by the naked afraid concept because it's people putting themselves out there of a full of, full of baloney, but it's very tough and it's not easy to do. And when you do it, whoo, it's an amazing feeling. So I think anything that's going to push someone's limit or get their, their adrenaline up is what's next. Oh, cool. Um, so in this stage now, as we, we're getting to the end, um, you've got a little window like a, to ask or tell the audience anything that you want for 60 seconds, things that you want to get off your chest, things that you want to share. So right. there's no question. It's open to you and say, off you go. All right. Uh, just I will just say this. You know, do not let life pass you by. Live life as if the next day is the last day. Suck the bone out of life. Nothing's guaranteed except the very moment you're breathing air right now. Get after it. You know, hug the ones you love. Keep them close. Tell them every day that you love them because you never know when you're going to exit this planet. For me, when I exit this planet, I don't want anyone to say, wow, because I'm going to ride this life as hard as I can, enjoy every minute on this planet. And the last thing I will say is when you're in front of somebody, Understand that's an opportunity to help somebody or influence them or change or save their life. Because the words or the actions you take when you're in front of somebody else can make a difference in this world. We have so many folks here and veterans committing suicide uh, to the tune of an average of 22 uh, plus a day here in this country. And I've had several friends affected by it and it's real. Mental health problems are real. So when you're in front of somebody or you have a medium just like this, Understand so you have a, a, an opportunity, sometimes for me, I feel it's a responsibility to help influence others and say things positively, stay positive, be encouraging, and the things you say and do can really change or save someone's life. I'm a positive person, got no time for negativity. So spread the peace, spread the love. That's awesome. Uh, thanks. That's a very powerful message. And, um, I personally will take that message on board as well. Um, so what's next for EJ? What's, what's, what's next for you? Um, few months year look like EJ well I'm going to continue forward like I said I'm looking at uh, doing a motivational book trying to gain more motivational speaking gigs always looking for work so I'm always trying to reinvent myself and, and just to keep the lights on my fire so to speak uh, you may or may not see me very 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 soon uh, gracing your screen again I'm always looking for uh, trying to get my uh, own TV show for a platform and a medium as I spoke earlier about influencing and motivating others. So we're always trying to uh, pitch shows to uh, my, with my manager to the network to see about me getting my own thing. Uh, until then, I'll, every challenge they put in front of me, I'm going to grab by the horns and, and ride that bull. You know, they say, say, ride the bull for eight seconds. Why do eight seconds when you can do eight years or eight decades? And that's what I plan on doing. Um, so look for me to stay active and, and be out there getting after it. Um, you know, when you, when you do what you love in life, you never work a day in your life. So I just try to live life to the fullest uh, every moment of the day. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's what my plans are. I'm, I'm still, like I said, I've got some things coming up. I've got some things on the future. You know, if you haven't seen me on First Man Out with Ed Stafford, a brilliant show, check me out, season one, episode four. It's on Discovery Go. And you can check it out there online. Uh, hoping for a return match with Ed Stafford. Ed, I'm calling you out. We were within minutes of each other. I showed my heart. I gave you everything I had. I wasn't in the best shape of my life, but I still showed up and I gave you help. Try <laughs> me in my best shape of my life and see where we go, mate. <laughs> well, that's a good call out there. We'll share that with Ed and see if he's brave enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I think he's scared. <laughs> so for those uh, of our listeners who want to get in touch with you, they want to find you, they want to read your stuff, they want to buy your products, how do we get in touch with you? Go to www.ejsnyder.com. Everything EJ's there. We're updating the website as we speak, but uh, there's some good stuff on there. All my social media links are there. But if you want to get with me on social media, go to Facebook. Go to EJ Skullcrusher Snyder. That's my public figure page. It's the one with 98,000 followers or likes. Go to there. Like it. Share it. Follow me there. On Instagram and Twitter, at EJ Snyder 333. And you can catch me at LinkedIn under the same name, EJ Snyder. Uh, go to the social medias, link up with me there. 
I have a gear page, all my newest gear. We've got a food line coming out uh, with survival, uh, emergency preparedness foods. Uh, we've been doing some survival gear, but we're uh, re-negotiating uh, some of that stuff at the moment. I have some amazing knives out. The SXB has been out since uh, 2015. That's my one big badass blade that I take because my knife broke in Africa and I'm not having that again. <laughs> and I have an SXS, Skull Crusher's Extreme Sidekick, which is a complimentary blade to my big one, but such a badass little blade on its own. It's a beast. And if you're looking for just a good hunting, camping, backpacking knife, a good overall bushcraft knife with a five inch blade, it's a nice little knife to have. So you can go to topsknives.com and purchase it there or look online. Awesome. Well, EJ, it's been an absolute pleasure to learn from you, listen to you, get to you, to hear your, your wisdom. Um, I'm really, really appreciative of your time. I know my son's going to love listening to this interview and learning more about EJ. But thanks so much for, for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Hey, I appreciate the time. Thanks for having me share my stuff with you and uh, share some stories. Now remember, get outside, get after it, and suck the bone marrow out of life. Yeah! This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth, and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips, and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now.